Chapter 12, The Respiratory System. Chapter Objectives. Clinical Objectives. Air passes through the nose, mouth, pharynx, larynx, and trachea, and then into the lungs. The nasal cavity is lined with mucous membranes that warms and moistens the air as it passes through. Mucous membranes secretes mucus that traps dust particles and bacteria. Cilia, which are small hair-like projections, propel the mucus toward the larynx so that the person can swallow or expectorate it, which is cough it up and spit it out. Paranasal sinuses, maxillary, frontal, sphenoid, and ethmoid are air-filled cavities lined with mucous membrane and situated along the facial bones around the nasal cavity. When swallowing begins, the epiglottis closes over the larynx, preventing the aspiration of food and secretions into the lungs. Food is then directed into the esophagus. When the swallowing reflex is weak or absent, aspiration is a risk. Sinuses reduce the weight of the skull, produce mucus, and influence the voice quality. The pharynx, consisting of the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx, is about five inches long, and it extends from the back of the mouth to the esophagus. It is a pathway for moving air to the lungs and food to the esophagus. Tonsils, which are part of the lymphatic system, are located in the oropharynx. The adenoids are located in the nasopharynx. If they become inflamed and enlarged, they may interfere with breathing. The epiglottis forms a hinged door at the entrance to the larynx. The larynx sits between the pharynx and the trachea. The vocal cords are located in the larynx. The trachea is made up of cartilage, smooth muscle, and connective tissue. It is lined with mucous membrane and extends from the larynx to the bronchi. It is the windpipe and carries air to the lungs. Inhalation after passing through the nose, pharynx, larynx, and trachea of the upper respiratory system. Air enters the left and right bronchi, which branch off of the trachea. The bronchi carry air into the lungs. The right lung has three lobes and the left lung has two lobes. Pleura is a serous membrane of two layers. The visceral pleura cover each lung and the parietal pleura lines the inner walls of the chest cavity. These two layers make up the pleural sac which encloses each lung and the chest wall and it is an airtight compartment. If the pleural sac is punctured, air will rush into the pleural cavity and collapse the lung. Small amount of fluid between the two layers of pleura lubricate the pleural cavity and prevent friction between the pleural layers with inhalation and exhalation. The central nervous system controls both involuntary and voluntary respiration via the pons and the medulla. Inspiration or inhalation and expiration or exhalation occur by movement of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles in the chest wall. The diaphragm is the primary respiratory muscle. When the diaphragm contracts, it moves downward. The other chest muscles contract, pulling the rib cage up and out, expanding the lungs and creating, creating an area of negative pressure. Air from the atmosphere, which has a positive pressure, flows into the lungs. If damage to the spinal cord occurs above the level where the phrenic nerve branches off to control the diaphragm, which is C4, 
voluntary respiration ceases. The alveoli are tiny air sacs covered with a permeable membrane that come into contact with the pulmonary arterioles and venules. Oxygen passes into the arterial blood and carbon, di carbon dioxide passes from the venous blood into the alveoli for exhalation. Alveoli are responsible for oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. The ability of the lungs and the chest to move air in and out of the body is called ventilation and it is clinically measured by end tidal CO2. A decrease in the immune system's efficiency makes older adults more susceptible to upper respiratory infection. Aging results in a decreased cough reflex and an increased potential for aspiration. Osteoporosis may cause kyphosis, which will impinge on the lung expansion. Adults age 70 years and older have some degree of change in connective tissues that cause decreased elasticity and affects the lung function as well as ventilation. The total body water decreases to 50% after age 70. Thus, mucus and respiratory membranes are not as moist and the mucus becomes thicker. There is some impairment of the ciliary action, which makes it more difficult for older adults to remove mucus and retained mucus provides a breeding ground for bacterial infection. There is a loss of normal elastic recoil of the lung during expiration, and older adults must use muscle action to complete expiration. This increases their work of breathing. Muscle atrophy may affect the respiratory muscles, diminishing their strength. Connective tissue damages and loss of elastic tissue in the alveoli cause the alveolar membranes to become baggy. Oxygen levels decrease for the older adult with partial pressure of oxygen dropping from 75 to 80 millimeters of mercury from the usual 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. There is a decreased response to hypoxemia, which is an oxygen deficit in the blood, and hypercapnia, which is an excessive amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. Patients with COPD may lean forward in a sitting position and use the abdominal muscles to force air out of the lungs. Other indications of difficulty breathing are elevating the shoulders and ribs, tensing the neck and shoulder muscles, and flaring the nostrils. A retraction of the spaces below and around the sternum also might be observed in the patient with respiratory distress. Obstructive disorders can cause enlargement of the front to back or anterior to posterior, posterior measurement of the chest wall, giving a barrel-like appearance to the chest because of the presence of trapped air in the lungs and inadequate recoil. Over time, there is a gradual elevation of the resting level of the diaphragm, which produces an increase in the size of the chest wall. Exhaling through pursed lips is a clue to obstructive disorders. As nurses, we listen for abnormal or adventitious lung sounds. Wheezes are a whistling, musical, high-pitched sound that is produced by air being forced through a narrowed airway. This sound is common in patients with asthma. Ronchi are coarse, low-pitched, rattling sounds caused by secretions in the larger air passages. Crackles are produced by air through moisture in the smaller airways. Coarse crackles are louder and low in pitch, 
and are heard in patients with bronchitis, pulmonary edema, and resolving pneumonia. Fine crackles are high in pitch and can be heard in patients who have atelectasis, fibrosis, pneumonia, or early congestive heart failure. Fine crackles sound similar to the sound produced by rubbing hairs between the fingers close to the ear. Pleural friction rub, which is a grating or scratchy sound similar to creaking shoe leather or, an, or opening a squeaky door, it will occur with irritated visceral and parietal pleural rub against each other. This also will produce pain for the patient. The sound and the pain will stop if the patient is asked to hold their breath. Strider or croaking sounds can be heard without the use of a stethoscope when there is partial obstruction of the upper air passages. These sounds are typically heard in children with croup, but can also occur in adults with upper airway obstruction. The inflammation that is producing the obstruction often also affects the larynx, producing hoarseness. It is important to distinguish between airway swelling and foreign body obstruction as a cause of strider. The presence of strider requires prompt assessment and intervention. When listening or auscultating the lungs, you need to move from one side of the midline of the chest to the other side and compare the bilateral sounds. Begin above the clavicles and progress downward in the intercostal spaces to above the sixth rib. On the back, start above the scapula and progress downward along the sides of the spine and then toward the lateral areas above the 10th thoracic vertebra. Perfusion is essential to provide oxygen to the cells of the body. Blood must flow past the alveolar membrane for diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide to take place. Cardiac disease, emboli, and other disorders of the heart and pulmonary blood vessel may cause problems in the respiratory system. An inhalation of bacteria and other organisms can quickly produce an infection in either the upper or the lower respiratory tract. Restrictive diseases are characterized by decreased lung capacity or compliance. Obstructive pulmonary diseases are characterized by problems moving air into and out of the lungs. Nurses should identify individuals who have a high risk for infection and refer them for the appropriate vaccinations and they should educate the individuals. For individuals who are resistant to the 5A listed on 5A model listed on this slide, an alternative model is the 5Rs. Help the patient identify their personal relevance, their risks, rewards, roadblocks, and repeat these at every visit. The interior of the nose, mouth, and pharynx, and the tonsils may be inspected using a tongue blade and a good source of light. The nose is inspected for redness, swelling, discharge, and lumps. Using a nasal speculum, the head is tilted upward and the inside of the nares is expected for pallor, redness, swelling, polyps, and for mucus color, consistency, odor, and amount. The hard and soft palates are inspected, and the mobility of the soft palate is evaluated by asking the patient to say, ah. The pharynx can be brought into view by asking the patient to say E. Presence of inflammation, lesions, plaques, or exudates should be noted. 
The paranasal sinuses are assessed by observing for purulent discharge in the nares and by palpating over the sinus areas for tenderness. The reason for culturing pharyngeal secretions is to establish a definitive diagnosis of infection with strepto streptococcus pyrogenes or strep throat. Sputum testing for acid fast bacilli is ordered when tuberculosis is suspected. Sputum specimens should be collected just after the patient awakens in the morning. Pulmonary function tests are useful in screening gross abnormalities in the respiratory system. Complete testing includes measurement of various volumes, flows, resistance, muscle strength, and arterial blood gases. Patients with asthma or COPD are asked to check their peak expir expiratory flow with the use of a peak flow meter. Normal values range from 300 to 700 liters per minute, but are assessed by comparison against the patient's baseline. When tumor is suspected, a lung biopsy may be obtained by a bronchoscopy or using a thoracoscopic approach or an open thoracotomy. This is the comparison of respiratory volumes and capacities as measured by spirometry. Routine sputum or normal sputum is white and slightly viscous and has no odor or taste. These are further characteristics of sputum and the possible causes. Diseases, trauma, changes in neurologic function, and metabolic disorders can all alter breathing patterns. Careful assessment of the rate and characteristics of a patient's breathing and recognizing changes in patterns can give the nurse valuable information regarding overall clinical status. The cough is usually a reflex triggered by a foreign substance or some other irritant in the respiratory tract. Coughing may be beneficial and should be encouraged if it is effective in clearing the air passages and remo removing accumulations of stagnant mucus. Dyspnea may or may not be a result of hypoxemia. Hypoxia results from not enough oxygen being delivered in the bloodstream to the tissues. For oxygen to reach the tissues, the patient must breathe adequately, have a patent airway, have lung tissue able to exchange gases, and have adequate hemoglobin to carry the oxygen and adequate blood flow to deliver the oxygen. Hypercapnia is the retention of excessive amounts of carbon dioxide. It is the result of hypoventilation, during which the usual amount of carbon dioxide is not eliminated by exhalation. Hypocapnia, which is a deficient of carbon dioxide, occurs as a result of hyperventilation and can result in respiratory acidosis. Conditions associated with hypocapnia include those in which there is an increased metabolic rate, salic salicylate overdose, and improper use of mechanical ventilation. Carbon dioxide is a respiratory stimulant. Therefore, the body responds to excessive levels of carbon dioxide by increasing the rate of respirations and the depth of respirations. Respiratory failure is defined by arterial blood gases. Arterial oxygen would be below 50 millimeters of mercury 
and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide would be equal to or greater than 50. Cardiac arrest may result from respiratory failure because of hypoxia and acid-base changes. Many acute upper respiratory infections are transmitted by droplets. The causative organisms are expelled along with liquid secretions released during coughing and sneezing. These droplets are heavy and fall to surfaces rapidly, rapidly usually within three feet of the patient. Diseases that are spread by airborne contamination have organisms that remain suspended in the air for long periods and float on air currents. Anorexia and inadequate nutrition are common in patients with respiratory disorders, particularly when the disorders are chronic. The patient may have an impaired sense of taste or smell, or the sputum may leave a bad taste in their mouth or cause them nausea. The patient may fear that chewing and swallowing will bring on an attack of coughing or may be so tired that eating or preparing food is just too exhausting. Hypoxia produces a loss of energy because it causes a disturbance in cellular metabolism. Patients with respiratory disorders often have hypoxia and use their energy to struggle for breath and cough up secretions. This slide shows some normal patterns of respiration. Eupnea would be a, a normal rate and rhythm. Kuzmals are fast and deep. There is no expiratory pause. This is seen in patients with diabetic ketoacidosis as well as coma. Chain stokes, this is when respirations become faster and deeper, then slower and shallower with a period of apnea. This is seen in patients in coma resulting from disorders or patients that are near death. As a nurse, we need to make sure we administer oxygen as prescribed. We use a calm manner and we want to assure the patient that everything possible is being done to bring relief of dyspnea. We coach the patient to perform pursed lip and diaphragmatic breathing. The high Fowler position is best for patients with dyspnea. Proper positioning and support allow the respiratory muscles to function at their maximum efficiency. For severe dyspnea, the orthopnic position is most effective. Orthopnea means that the patient has trouble breathing when supine. The patient should sit upright, lean over the overbed table, which should be padded with pillows, and elevate and round the shoulders to allow maximum expansion of their lungs. A, the normal fingernail angle is 160 degrees. B shows early mild clubbing that appears as a flattened angle between the nail and the skin. C is advanced clubbing that shows a round or clubbed fingernail, fingertip and nail. To assess clubbing by Shamrock's method, in D and E, place the nails of the second digits together. Obliteration of the normal diamond shaped space between the nails is an abnormal finding and signifying clubbing. Older adults do not acquire upper respiratory infections more frequently than other age groups but due to a decreased immune system response and chronic illness, they more frequently have complications. 
When assessing an older adult patient, it is important to obtain a thorough smoking history and a history of alcohol intake throughout adulthood. Approximately 90% of throat cancer occurs in people who both smoke and immoderately drink alcohol, and it is four times more common in men. Restlessness, agitation, or mental confusion, or an increase in heart rate, are all early indicators of inadequate oxygenation of the blood. As a nurse, you should make sure you have a baseline assessment of the patient's mental status and vital signs to be able to identify early changes. According to the Joint Commission in 2018, their core measures, all providers of healthcare should ask patients age 65 and older if they have received a pneumococcal vaccine to prevent pneumococcal bacteremia and they should encourage the vaccination if it is indicated.